now's the opportunity for a, a more open forum. So um, now that you've had the chance to refresh to yourself and so get a coffee and a caffeine Thanks, and whatever Mark. else, um, we'll, we'll get this session going. Sorry. Our panel, um, oh, four of whom you've already heard from, Peter Ashworth, Alan Finkel, Patrick Hartley and Graham Middlemas. But I'd like to introduce the other two members of the panel. Um, David Byers, who is the CEO of CO2CRC. So all of those questions about um, carbon capture and storage, if you're still on your mind, you can direct them at David now. David has more than 30 years experience across oil, gas and minerals in Australia and overseas. He's worked in CEO and senior leadership roles in public, membership and commercial organisations. And prior to joining the CO2CRC in July 2018, he was the interim CEO of the Minerals Council of Australia. So he's a very experienced person. So I'd get you to welcome David to the... And the other, the other presenter who's joining us for this session is Jane Oakley, who is the CEO of the Committee for Gippsland. Jane has been the interim CEO at the Committee of Gippsland for the last couple of months, and last week was appointed CEO. Is that correct? It is. It is. Strange way this all came up. So, <coughs> Jane is the CEO, not an the old interim bit that's not relevant anymore. She's very well known to many Gippslanders for her executive experience across government and business, as well as demonstrating a deep commitment to the local community in a number of capacities. So, could you welcome Jane? <laughs> now, the way we're going to run this, um, we, we put a question out to the panel to get them to think long before they came here. So I'll read out the question they were asked to think about. As we have seen today, the hydrogen economy has both significant potential and risks for the region. From your perspective, what is needed for the region to best position itself to be able to take advantage of the opportunity and mitigate the risks? So what we're going to do, I'm going to ask in turn each of these panel members to speak for a few minutes. Uh, this is not a half hour presentation, <laughs> guys, just a few minutes, and stimulate your thinking. And if you wouldn't mind, then get your questions in your mind, and we'll open it up to the floor for questions, comments um, around this theme, particularly around this theme, but as it goes on, if there are burning questions people want to know about later on, we'll come back to them. So perhaps I'll just go along the table. Peter? No. Is that better? Okay. Can I just say it's a much better view up here? I can see everyone and make eye contact. It was a bit hard down there. Um, what I'm going to say is not going to surprise anyone. Engage with the people and get them on board to work with you around the projects. Answer the questions that they might have. I think, you know, there's lots of ways, and I was just having a conversation at before, is involving communities in the projects as much as possible where you can is, is really critical to that. So I guess I'll, t I'll take a technology viewpoint and say I, I think the, the, the really crying need at the moment is more demonstration and more uh, more uh, understanding of how all of these systems work and, and people to think about the opportunities that uh, the business opportunities that can arise from this uh, for the region uh, and for individual entrepreneurs I guess yeah, I've got one. Um, in terms of what the region can do I, my first advice would be for all of the community but particularly the leadership be patient this is a genuine prospect, but it will take time. Every aspect of building demand domestically and internationally, the first steps have been taken, but the giant leap for mankind has got a long way to go. So be patient. Um, again, in terms of speaking to community leaders, I'd say explain to the community what the opportunities are, but don't overpromise. This is the beginning of a journey. The one thing you know for sure is it won't evolve or eventuate exactly as we're predicting at the moment. So as long as people have some understanding that there's a lot of fluidity but a goal in mind, I think you'll bring them along a lot more. And the third thing I would say is uh, work with governments, work with the local universities such as Federation University and other universities in Victoria who are interested in this to think beyond just the export of hydrogen to exporting that hydrogen in a different form. 
And we've heard today about ammonia, not just as a carrier, but ammonia as a finished product. Uh, there was some mention of fertilizer. From ammonia, you can make fertilizer. Now you would have green fertilizer. Is that the start of a new market for con uh, emissions conscious people like Europeans? Um, hydrogen can be exported as embodied energy, not in La Trobe Valley, but in other places in Victoria. I hope, in Australia, I hope it will be used to take iron ore, which is ferrous oxide, and strip off the oxide so that you've got the pig iron, which is a much higher value product that can be exported. So work with the universities to think beyond just hydrogen in its pure form. Me next? Yes. I think the, great, the greatest danger our community faces is in not grasping this opportunity. Um, our economy will decline as the, uh, the, what I call the open cycle, brown coal power stations close over, a, over the next decade or two. And we need to have something in place for an economy uh, to, to keep, keep our, our level of uh, economy happening here. So the big risk is not grasping this opportunity. And where I sit, given the heavy industry experience here, the, uh, the type of workforce we've got, uh, I don't see a problem with us moving into what we've talked about today. The problem may come about in not carrying our community with us. And, and uh, that's the biggest issue. It's persuading people that this is a safe process that will provide good jobs and uh, aid the Australian economy. So. Um, I think the first thing in, in all this is to get out and sell our community on the advantages and what this process involves. That uh, The much talked about dangers, the way I see it, are not really there if they're managed well. So it's again, it's, it's about uh, uh, getting our community on side because I'm sure uh, we have the skills, we have the ability here to do it almost straight away. I take Alan's point about not overselling. Uh, if I'm asked to discuss another uh, magnesium um, refinery, I mean, we've been promised five in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, nobody wants to talk up things that never happen. So it's, it's a gentle process, but the key is carrying our community with us because we can do it. We have the ability. We could do it tomorrow. From what I've heard here today, uh, Hongo San's presentation on, on the process, the machinery, all that kind of stuff, we could get into that tomorrow. We have the skills, we have the ability to do all that stuff. It's carrying our community with us on the journey, but I think this is something we need to, to maintain our local economy. Tom? Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Um, look, I think the first thing I would say is that uh, going back to Alan Finkel's earlier presentation, I think the first important thing that we need to do in a national context is to ensure we take a technology neutral approach to the production to development of hydrogen. And that is an area I'm a little bit worried about, that um, from being engaged in the uh, fossil fuel industry, hydrocarbons industry, really for the bulk of my career, I know how things can go wrong. So I think we really just need to make sure that we do take an open mind and ensure that we're pursuing both pathways is the first point I'd make. The second point is to reflect on the fact, and we've talked about this today, but that particularly in this region, there are a number of competitive advantages in terms of the skill sets of people, the coal resource, the proximity to uh, a major storage basin for CO2. So there's a number of natural assets to be able to um, uh, capitalise on, if you like, and make sure that you do take a, a, the advantage of that opportunity. Um, but the third point is to really recognise that just as we've talked about this within a hydrogen only context, we need to recognise that hydrogen itself is going to be part of an energy contest. And there'll be advances in technologies in other uh, energy forms. And so we need to ensure that um, what we do here is to acknowledge that hydrogen itself, notwithstanding its promise, is still going to be in competition with other forms of energy. And I guess the, uh, the, the probably the, the final thing I would say, or maybe two more points, would be to recognise as well that uh, one of the benefits of this region is the HESC project. It gives the region great connections internationally. 
that's going to be needed for to be able to participate in the hydrogen uh, um, economy. And, um, you know, we have the ability to be able to partner with Japanese companies, I think, is a tremendous asset. It puts us somewhat ahead of the game in terms of other regions. That's an important thing we have to um, acknowledge. But then that means there's an obligation to be able to do the project really well and execute really well and from a local perspective and a Victorian state and a national perspective to really support that project to the best of our capability. And finally, um, I echo the comments of Graham here about the, the need for trust. The trust within the community is going to be critical and that's going to require some community leadership, some government leadership and leadership from the industry as well. Thanks. Um, today's been really informative and uh, I look at the opportunities that present to our region and they're significant and I think one of the things that we've got to stay open to is uh, building on, on the platform of what exists today within industry but also new and emerging and I think that comes from really becoming really clear on our comparative advantage. What is that that's going to draw investment and it's going to be able to be supported? We've got to work across the whole region to define that and I think that's really important and as many have touched on on the panel here is that social responsibility to that social engagement you know bring the community along the journey as we define that comparative advantage and then we start to identify what sort of investment do we want in these areas what are we willing to accept and I think if we can define that and then guide that to the appropriate sort of area within our region we will really maximize the opportunity Thank you very much. Now, the floor is open. So you've got on, on the, the stage, you've got three very eminent technology science specialists and three that operate in both local and national, both in the context of social licensing in its broader sense. So you have an opportunity to ask questions. The theme of trying to what do you do locally is what I'd prefer the questions to stay at in the short term. We'll come back to some general ones later on. So if the questions relate to this theme, what does the lo what do you do to capture this? That's where I'd like to start, if you don't mind. So first question over here, Paul. Yeah, thank you. It's um, My name's Paul Curry with GHD. Uh, I thank you all very much for the, uh, the many presentations today. And I, I certainly see that there's been a lot of discussion and, and evidence of the fantastic opportunities that we have in the region here for hydrogen uh, through a number of projects, but certainly through the HES project, but also through uh, potential for a lot of other high value coal products from say the Carbon Innovation Centre and other, other people looking for opportunities. And I think through those we can see there's many of these opportunities really need and will allow a, a lot of other opportunities to come into La Trobe Valley through a CCS program. And as we've also heard, there's increasing competition globally in this space. And so we really, for the Latrobe Valley, we really need to make sure we position ourselves to make the best of our opportunity. So my question is, do we see a very clear pathway for the carbon net project to be expedited and brought in early enough so that these opportunities can be reached? Thank you. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, Alan? I'm only speaking from the uh, perspective of having benefited from a couple of presentations from the Carbon Net team. But beyond that, I have no specific expertise. But I'm very impressed with what I've seen. You can see the 10 years of accumulated knowledge and the planning, and they have a clear path forward. They've got the money to drill a first well. But the long-term intention is for it to not be a government project and somehow be um, either privatised or otherwise managed. And it's very important because Carbonet is essential for the sec success of the HESC project. Um, if it's not Carbonet, it has to be another CCS project or program, and I'm not aware where that is. So Carbonet does seem at this stage to be essential. I would hope that either the government keeps it. I'm not rec making a recommendation. It's not my position to make a recommendation. I would hope that either the government keeps it or 
that it ends up in the hands of a strategic acquirer rather than a financial acquirer. What do I mean by strategic acquirer? acquirer a company that knows how to do things under, deep in, in the ground at the end of a hole and in the water, like Exxon or Woodside or Chevron or Equinor or whatever. Um, but if, for example, a consortium of bankers were to buy it, I would not feel comfortable. I might, I might have a try as well. Just, I, I think in terms of just the timing, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not that, that far out. I mean, I mean, the decision to go commercial with the HES project is, is you know, a few years away yet. Uh, and and Carbonet has has uh, got some work to do to get its uh, get its injection ready as well. So I don't think the timing's too far mismatched. No. It would be my take. I'm not an expert, but I would say it's pretty close. Yeah, I'll just make a comment as well. Um, from the perspective of an organisation which is hoping to supply some of the supply some of the technologies to Carbonet, I certainly do hope it's going to uh, <coughs> thrive as a, as a project. But look, all the signs are good. Uh, all the technical work is being done. It's being done. Uh, in a quite rigorous way. Um, they've set themselves out for a long-term focus on being able to uh, gather all of the regulatory permits that are required. I know we've been working with them as an organisation in terms of some of the longer-term CO2 monitoring technologies that can be put in place offshore. So all those things are really being done. And I think it's going to come down, well, yes, there's the whole issue of uh, having a private operator take over um, Carbonet. I think it's going to need to be done on a sound technical basis and from what I can see that's, going, that's all being done very, very well. I think the other thing I'll say, it's a reflection too of what's happening with carbon capture and storage in the country is that there's a lot more interest and a lot more focused and I can even say that even as of today, Chevron announced earlier today that it has started uh, injection CO2 at its Barrow Island uh, facility in Gorgon. They finally got those uh, facilities up and running and have commence that injection process where they're going to be injecting three to four million tonnes per annum. And I think that's going to be a substantial, if you like, demonstration effect beyond what even my organisation does at the uh, Otway Field Test Laboratory in Western Victoria. It's a substantial um, milestone to have another commercial project in Australia, which helps to therefore pave the way for the carbon net project. I'm just going to give a plug that if any of you have children in the area, there's a good science week activity happening around Carbonet, which is also an important part of community and engagement. So just giving them a plug, there's flyers on your table. Second questionnaire here. Hi, thank you very much. It's Ming Liu from Daimler Technologies. Maybe my question follows David's comments about uh, the coal to hydrogen. We know the hydrogen from coal is somehow is a coal chemical byproduct. And for coal chemicals, a lot of like uh, other products like uh, carbon materials or maybe liquid ma materials. When we design the, like, uh, like a coal to hydrogen policy, how can we align the other po uh, policy for like a coal to other materials? For example, coal to carbon or coal to ammonia or coal to methane or this kind of more high value uh, material. What's it? So, cool. so the, question, the question, Ming, is, is around around um, how to align government policy to, s to stimulate those sorts of things. Is that what yeah? I think yeah. when we design like a hydrogen policy, it's not only hydrogen product, the yeah. other other product. Yeah, I think it's like any other industry, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, it's you, you kind of have to make a value proposition and uh, and seek investment. I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't suggest there was anything necessarily new and uh, uh, new new mechanisms required to do that. I think all new businesses have to. Have to have, have have to have help at the beginning for sure, uh, but ultimately it will be a business business decisions that, that, that win. So can I add to that in the context of the national hydrogen strategy that we're in the process of developing? Um, as I mentioned briefly in my talk, it, it's unlikely that we're going to see governments throwing huge amounts of money into hydrogen projects in the way that they are in Japan, uh, California, Korea, and China. That doesn't mean the Australian government isn't interested or the state governments aren't interested. We're a different economy, a different approach to doing these things, and our economic market approach is typically to 
set the levers right and let the market work things out. So through the National Hydrogen Strategy, uh, our big aim is to create a framework such that it then becomes easy for companies to find opportunities without being held back by barriers. So removing a barrier is just as effective as contributing something to a project. It's a basic minus, taking away a minus one is a plus. And if we can get um, all the standards agreed across the states and harmonised with international standards and the regulations, if we can work with the International Maritime Organisation to make sure that we've got um, the ability to ship beyond just the test project, but to ship regularly hydrogen across the international seas. If we can um, encourage through this framework the national government to set up bilateral trade relationships around hydrogen products, these kinds of framework activities will make it much easier for companies and state governments to start new things. What I am seeing already in Australia is the federal government investing through its investment in ARENA for demonstration projects, um, to some extent through its investment through the National Science Agency being the CSIRO, and that's terrific. And the state governments are all actively thinking about what they can do and putting not huge but decent sides, pots of money aside for their state hydrogen strategies. So if we can get the national approach smoothed out so that it's a conducive framework, that makes it then easier, I think, for states to do what states do really well, which is identify things that are good for their economy and, in many cases, then work with industry to pull something off. So that's what I see as the way forward. Thank you. Questions? David? Thank you, David Brockway. Thank you for all the presentations today. I was just wondering what sort of planning is being given to the transition to get to a full um, CCS system, or particularly the full pipeline system, um, from and assuming that success with the J Power Eagle gasifier and the hydrogen production, um, to get to a full scale where the um, <coughs> the transport and sequestration costs will be the minimum, whatever the minimum may be, um, that will require, well, let me put it differently, you, the cost of the pipeline, the pipeline transport and the compression and so on um, <coughs> will be very high per tonne of CO2 for a relatively small amount of CO2. So if the first gasifier goes in with a modest amount of hydrogen and a modest amount of CO2, um, it won't be nearly as economic as a full-scale project with a number of gasifiers. So that seems to me to be a significant hurdle to overcome early in the process. So is any thought or planning being given to that part or that hurdle in the process of achieving the CCS for the hydrogen? I can have a crack at that. Uh, I think I understand, David. The, so the, the, the demonstration project, which is going on right now, doesn't actually do CCS. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, no, about the, the intermediate. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that so, one. Uh, I, I can give it a try. Um, so D David's, if I understand your concern, it's the big capital investment to make the long-term operation cost effective, but then you've got five or ten years of operation where you don't have the production scale to justify the pipeline infrastructure. Um, I have some confidence in our Japanese colleagues. So the discussions that I've had, and I've had a few with the leadership of J-Power, and the discussions that I've had with the leadership of Kawasaki Heavy Industries, um, 
it indicates to me that these companies have been in business for a long time and have long-term strategic thinking. Uh, they're technologically very powerful and they understand, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, but they understand that in an industry like this, the payback will take time. And so unlike some of the experiences that you and we might have had, we are talking about companies who are thinking big, thinking long-term, and are thinking strategically. And that gives me some comfort that they'll go ahead, even if the two to five year payback is poor, as long as the five and 10 and 15 year payback is significant. So there's no simple solution, but staying power is important. If I could just offer, if I could break your real Jerry and just enlarge it beyond the region. Um, because I think it's relevant, it's, you know, the, the question you raised, David, is really something which um, is in any kind of hub concept, CCS hub concept, and um, the notion that you're wanting to get that foundational customer looms large as one of the premier risk factors in developing a, a hub concept. So if I look at, for example, what's happened in Norway, trying to develop a similar sort of um, hub there, which Brad probably knows more about than I do. Um, but essentially, uh, their governments are looking to take on some of that initial risk, to be able to, if you like, take on that foundational customer risk so that it becomes easier to have more uh, customers come along to be able to take the volumes. Um, and in actual fact, um, Brad's organisation, the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute and mine and a number of the uh, industry associations have put a, a bundle of policy proposals to the federal government which they're reviewing. One of them is to deal with that whole issue of trying to take that upfront risk. How do you take, how do you, how do you reduce the risk of that sort of initial customer risk? And it might involve some kind of bridging role for government until you can get a sort of hub concept up and running. Now I'm not saying that's going to apply you know, immediately to carbon net, but the, the point that you're raising is if you like a, it's a well-known one in many of those like sort of CCS hub concepts, and it is probably going to require in other circumstances perhaps some degree of government intervention to be able to set that on the right pathway. Got a question here in the front, and then I've got one right over the back afterwards, yes. Um, Wendy Farmer, I just wanted a couple of points. We, we've spoken a lot about carbon capture and storage, but we haven't actually spoken about any other pollutants that come from coal to hydrogen. And as a community advocacy group, and you know, when we talk about speaking with community and getting community license, communities actually want to know the other pollutants. They want to know how we are going to handle those pollutants rather than not talk about them at all. Now, we've met with a company ourselves and asked quite a few questions. Some were answered and some weren't answered. And I think we need to start being open when we look at these projects and we look at beautiful brochures and everything else about a great project. Let's talk about the stuff that isn't that good in it and how we're going to handle it. One of the um, other people earlier spoke about groundwater and that question wasn't really answered in relation to this project. So let's, if we're going to get community engagement and community agreeing on pushing these projects forward, we need to be upfront and tell the truth about what is happening. One, but my question is, when we talk about coal is cheap, we often don't talk about the health impact, which Latrobe Valley is the first health innovation zone, and we don't talk about rehabilitation of the coal fields. Now, I don't know if I still hear the coal mining minister um, but what I want to know is, with this project and other projects, I want, want to know from the um, company doing this project, but I also want to know from the Trobe City Council, are we going to make sure that rehabilitation is taken into the project before the project starts? Will the Trobe City Council make sure that proper rehabilitation is put into the project before the project starts? Well, perhaps I should ever go at that. You get, um, you get first cap off the record, this one. First thing, we don't have the authority over rehabilitation. 
uh, areas like that. All we can do is advocate, and uh, I agree with you, we will be advocating very strongly to see what the rehabilitation outcome is out of the total project. You talked about groundwater. Uh, when I spoke about carrying the community with us, that was a question that was asked. It's a question that has to be answered. So um, I'm quite open on this. I believe every question that is thrown up by the community should be addressed. If we are to persuade our community that this is a great idea, we need to be open and address all the questions asked. So. Um, I have no problem with what you're saying. I have no problem with the council advocating that all questions should be answered before we move forward into this. So, uh, when I said we've got to carry the community, you and I were talking about exactly the same thing. Can I just say that it's a really very important point. I'm currently working on, and Peter is a consultant in this project, a review of the offshore oil exploration regulator and I've got to tell you, and so I know now a lot about offshore oil regulation that I didn't know two months ago um, and I know nothing about onshore but in the offshore area it's really very strict the um, environmental regulations require that the applicant to drill a well or do seismic surveys um, do a number of formal tasks of which the biggest and hardest is the environmental plan where they have to think about all of the impacts and all of the means of mitigation right out for the life of the project. And if that exists onshore today, I'm sure it didn't 50 years ago, but if that exists onshore <coughs> today, then I think it would address exactly what you're asking for. So I don't have the answer, but I've certainly seen an example in the offshore world. And I don't know if anybody knows what the rules are for onshore, new mines and exploration. I, perhaps I'll make a comment simply because my, my, one of my past sins was heading up the environmental assessment function in the Commonwealth Government many years ago. Um, and, and through that I interacted with state colleagues doing environmental assessment. I would imagine in the context of a new project of scale in, in Gippsland that it would have to go through a full environmental assessment. Now, I, I can't be absolutely certain of that because I'm not up to date with state law in this, in this space. And, um, that's, I'm right, am I? We'd have to go through. In those, in those assessments, all of those issues have to be drawn out and put into the public space. Now, for a lot of, for a lot of proponents, they see that as a lot of unnecessary work because you end up with identifying a whole lot of minor things that can be mitigated against or, or in some way managed. But from my experience, the big deal was tell the community what it is. That's, that's the... They just want to know, and they want to know what you're going to do about it, and at that point you can make judgments. It's, it's not possible to make the judgments beforehand because I don't think there's been a project of scale in the valley that would have required environmental assessment, but certainly around Australia there are all sorts of major projects, and particularly in the mining space, as David was certainly aware, and, and of course... We've got the infamous one right now on our plate uh, up in Queensland, the Adani project. It did go through all sorts of environmental assessments. The judgments, it, it brought all the information out. Then, of course, it gets down to judgments by individuals and those judgments have ended up saying, no, it's OK to proceed. But I think the important thing that you are asking for is what are the hidden things that you don't see? And I would imagine they come out in the environmental assessment. Now, I, I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong in the context of Victorian law, but I think I'm pretty right. So there is a pathway that you would see and be able to interact with. And Jerry, I could just add to you know in um, in respect of what are any known as large coal mines, or in, in fact most oil and gas installations now, there's a provision under the uh, federal environmental legislation, the EPBC Act, which means they're subject to a water assessment. So um, those things are covered not just in state legislation but also federal legislation when it meets the relevant criteria. So, you know, there's, there's been some changes. Those, in, those changes were introduced, I think, in about 2013 or 14. So. Okay. Um, I have a quick question right down the back corner. Yes, the hall there. Hmm. 
My name is Pat Bartholomews. Uh, with the committee, the present organization of CarbonNet be strengthened if we had a motion from this meeting asking both governments, state and federal, to ensure the continuity of the project without selling it off to somebody else in the light of many, many projects being launched in this area, as, as the mayor mentioned, uh, that have not come to, fru to fruition. If they're going to maintain the confidence of the community, as you have all spoken about, I think it's really important that the governments realize that this one is not to be sold and unsold because I never thought in my, that in my lifetime I'll see power stations being bought and sold like, like they were a kilogram of sugar in a supermarket. So from that point of view, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Chairman, whether you'd like a motion from this meeting asking for the continuation of the Carbonet project in the hands of a team that have worked so diligently and have expressed uh, their confidence in the progress of the program. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me make an observation first, um, just to, to clarify. Um, we won't take a motion and vote on it because that's not the purpose of the forum and I think it would be unfair given the way we structured this to put that on, on people to start to think about that. But I think the point you're making, the valid point you're making, is that there have been the promise of projects that don't get delivered. And I, I know that personally from the, our discussions that Brian have had with the, with the Treasurer and others um, when we go in and say, look, we, we want to keep developing these ideas. And they'll say, yeah, but come on, all of it, we've pro been promised lots of projects and none of them ever happened, so what, what difference would it make now? It is a real problem, and I think that was the essence of part of our stimulating a discussion here, was what is it that the Valley needs to do to capture the projects? What does this community, should this community be doing? So if there's, if there's a sense of um, a need for a motion to go to the government about you know, a, a resolution about whatever, I think it's appropriate that's done in the context of both the council and perhaps the committee for... Gippsland, and you might want to comment on that, Jane, about the process. But I think the, the, the theme behind that point is a very valid one. How do you capture the projects? Otherwise, you just have this long litany. I actually, um, I think Alan Blood's gone. Yes, Alan, as you know, had a Latrobe Valley fertiliser project lined up to come to the valley, and it never eventuated. And Alan, if he were here, would be jumping up and down to tell you why it didn't eventuate. But I noticed the other day, I'm reading a paper, there's going to be a fertiliser plant up at Tamworth. If the New South Wales government give them OK to take the gas from fracking. So there's another debate going on up there. But the context that I thought of was the valley should have had that. The valley could have a fertiliser plant. It's already got a, one fertiliser operation that's not a gasification project, and that's through Omnia, and a very valuable contribution it's making to this community. The project for the Trove Valley Fertilisers was a gasification into urea. So, in fact, it even captured the carbon in the, in the fertiliser and took it off and used it in the natural world where carbon is part of a carbon cycle. So I was a bit bemused when I read the paper and a project that could be in here tomorrow hasn't been captured. I don't know why, I'm not the expert locally. And Tamworth is now uh, under the guise of, I think it's Santos, have proposed a fertiliser plant up there. Whether it happens or not is another matter because they've got the, the, the gas fracking debate going on strongly up there. So perhaps if, with those few comments, Jane, you might want to start off with. Sure. I, I really think there's an opportunity for our region to have a better narrative about our future and where we want to be and then work back from there. I, having worked in 
local and state government. I've seen many projects sort of come and go. Um, some have been successful, but continually sort of asking ourselves about what does this mean in terms of achieving our aspirations as a region. I think that's something we've got to get better at defining. Um, in terms of economic development, I think this has always been a challenging one as well in terms of you know, um, being really clear about our competitive advantage and then working closely with um, tiers of government to make sure that that's agreed and consolidated because I've seen a number of investment opportunities directed through Melbourne and Gippsland doesn't get on the radar in terms of being a viable destination because we have the, the resources, the skills, the, whatever we might, the water, whatever we might have to accommodate that investment. So I think more work really needs to be taken on board locally in terms of defining that narrative of where we're heading and therefore we'll be able to define more succinctly what that investment looks like and then going back and re-engaging with government with that, that pitch. Graham, did you want to say something in, in Yeah, the this is a, a very delicate area because uh, it's a case of persuading the, the, the state government to get involved. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, in the metropolitan areas, uh, the metropolitan cities of Australia, coal is bad, is accepted as a mantra. And uh, I, I can't speak for the state government, but I think they are very wary of any project unless it can be proved to be an absolute certainty. So therefore, we get a lot of propositions put up, proposals put up around coal uh, for La Trobe Valley, but they don't seem to go forward uh, very often. And I think it's, again, this um, public opinion in Melbourne, largely, um, that is against coal. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any desire to examine what a particular project looks like. So the only way I think we can break through that is if we talk as a total community. It's, uh, our, our council is regularly saying to the government, look at this proposal, this isn't a bad proposal. We can create jobs here, we can create wealth here. Um, we don't seem to be able to break through, but I think if our, our entire community, and I'm talking about the business side, the, the residents, everybody spoke for the need for some of these projects to be examined in more detail, we might be able to persuade the government to, shall we say, be less reserved about coal. But at the moment, um, you know, if you talk to, uh, I don't want to characterise this as an inner city problem, but if you talk to people um, in the inner city areas of all the major cities, it's a very simple mantra, coal is bad. I think that influences governments, but uh, somehow, and I, one of the ways I think is if all our community spoke with one voice, and I'm not just talking to council, we might be able to get the, the, the government to look more closely at coal proposals, and there are many of them out there. Uh, as a council, we see these regularly. Every month or two, somebody comes up with a proposal. But at the moment, they're not breaking through. And the only way I can think is uh, uh, a united team, a united approach. We want to look at them. And I'm not talking about just simple open cycle, open burning uh, coal projects. Most of the ones that are coming across our, our uh, desks at the moment are low or zero emission projects which I think warrant a much closer look. But it's breaking through uh, the view of governments that coal is bad and uh, it's a very difficult problem. But we're certainly pushing it, I can assure you. I might just jump in. One of the things, I mean, I have run focus groups back in 2014, even before then. So I've come down to the valley quite regularly and one of the things that I really picked up a long time ago was the sale of the SEV when that was privatised and, and the impact that that had on, on this community. I, I, I clearly remember many years ago, and I've probably used this example before, of a woman who was about 30 who talked about her father taking the redundancy when SEV was sold. And she said, up till that, up till that time, we always went away for our holidays, but after that our holidays were in the backyard severely impacted their whole life in that way. So I think there's a sense of this here. Um, I guess for projects like this, it's this the role of government, public-private partnerships and all of these things. That's what's happening a lot in carbon capture and storage. So I guess it depends on so many things around 
when a price for carbon, I'm sure one day that's going to come, a price on CO2, that will change the economics. There's things the UK government used to look at with contract for difference. And then there's the idea of actually, well, is the government the best person to run a CCS project? Or is it actually better done by private and David might have an idea? So I think there's a lot of parts to even unpicking that idea. But also the question about those people in the city and their, their ideas, actually our national surveys, when you look, you tend to get a spread. So I think also we need to sometimes, what we hear often is the loud voices, the extremes, but like what we talk about, you know, I was actually intrigued around the, that idea of the quiet Australians because I've actually got this paper I'm writing around when we look at the spread of attitudes towards energy technologies. Everybody wants to be renewables eventually, they don't necessarily want to pay for it all straight now. But I think actually we see there's a whole lot of people, like I showed in there, that sit in the middle and not too sure. So I think we've also got to be careful because it, often it's the governments are listening to the loud voices and actually not cutting through. The last sort of um, focus groups I did for Carbonet and we ran some in Preston, in Frankston, and most of those people um, had connections to the valley or, and so they were actually very supportive of thinking about those things. So I think also we've got to be careful sometimes to, to cut through that and really find out. Questions, comments? In the middle there. Well, Ian Spark, Federation Uni. Churchill campus, it seems to me that one of the problems with social licence is that it's too easy to mount a false qualitative argument to influence the public. And what I mean by a false qualitative argument is an argument that when you put the numbers in, it actually turns out that the dreaded effect turns out to be negligible. So how can we overcome the public being influenced by these false qualitative arguments? Thanks, Ian. I really think it, it comes from the way in which we engage, and I think engagement's got to take place at an earlier stage, and it comes right back to that sort of that narrative and that, you know, the early days of planning and we've got to engage more broadly. I mean, I too have seen some of those surveys where it's a sample and all of a sudden that's what the majority think. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a continuous process and we've always got to improve on that. I think it's something that is really difficult. But for me, it comes back to those early stages of, you know, where do we want to be? What do we want Gippsland to look like? Where do we want investment directed? And community are informing that process and business. Can I add to that some experiences I had um, when I was doing the electricity review taught me that you don't earn the respect of the public by going out and trying to convince them. Uh, you don't turn people away from believing false qualitative arguments by saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to explain it to you. Trust or social licence is something that has to be earned and the way to earn it, I think, is by being absolutely transparent and sharing information. So respond to false qualitative arguments, not by in-kind participation around <coughs> that kind of argument because you just give it oxygen. Just stick with the facts. If the facts don't support the case of the government, well, that's just bad luck. But if the facts do, and they're presented clearly through websites, through social media, through forums like this one, I actually have a lot of respect over time for the ability of the public to understand difficult issues. But they haven't got a chance if the response to some false narrative out there is a trivial response or an attempt to persuade rather than an attempt to share factual information really transparently. Just make a comment as well. <clears throat> um, again, based on you know other experiences in the resources sector, um, Peter, I don't think we've talked about this, but I was actually involved very early in the uh, coal seam gas issues in Queensland and the eastern part of Australia. And 
from the very difficult days right through to the days when it started to turn around, I think there were a couple of critical ingredients in that. And I don't quite know what the analogy is in this debate, but anyway, I'll have a go. The first thing was turning around the relationship with the farmers, the people who are directly uh, affected, and giving them, if you like, a bit of a stake in the benefits. That was a very important aspect to turning around the whole, uh, if you like, pers pers uh, perception of the industry in Queensland. And <clears throat> the second thing really I would say was getting the right people to talk in very, very practical terms. And I often found in terms of explaining what fracking was all about, the best people to do that were actually the drillers, the people who did the drillings, not the theoreticians, but the people who could explain all of the precautions that went into and all of the ways in which you actually drill the well. And do that by analogy with, say, what farmers were used to, which was drilling a water well. And then you could see the enhanced range of protections involved from the perspective of a driller in doing that for a hydrocarbon as well. So again, I think sometimes we come at these things in probably too lofty a position and you have to really sort of engage with people. And I think, Peter, you, you, you um, described um, a third example before, which was actually getting the, the farmers engaged in testing the levels of water and so forth. It's giving them a little bit of a role in the whole process as well, is often a key to making people very comfortable with the fact that they can see themselves um, what is actually happening rather than just being um, you know, given the theory of what should be happening. Okay, Daryl, last, this is the last question because I'm conscious that a lot of people will want to get on their way both home and uh, in cars and everything else. Daryl? Thank you. Uh, my my uh, question, uh, I've got two thoughts in my mind. One is that in relation to um, uh, understanding about uh, the CO2 emissions that are being emitted to the atmosphere in Australia, we've had um, the Hazelwood Power Station closed down, we've had uh, the power station closed down in South Australia, Port Augusta, and uh, we're seemingly we're significantly emitting CO2 to the atmosphere. And uh, but. I'm wondering whether the outcome of that, what the outcome of that has been. The, I seem to have this thought in my mind that uh, from the Australian point of view that it's uh, been uh, indicated that it really has made no difference so far as uh, the amount of CO2 that's being emitted in the atmosphere from Australia. Somebody might like to clarify that for me. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, and I talked about a little bit earlier today, was that um, we were talking about um, social license, etc. And uh, and one of the graphs we had up there today, I think it was something like 60% of the CO2 that's being emitted in the atmosphere in Australia is coming from fossil fuels. And fossil fuels uh, that were listed there were coal, gas and oil. And um, as I said earlier, the um, coal seems to be carrying the load in regard to this issue. And uh, there doesn't seem to be a... Um, understanding out there that 40%, uh, I'd say, of the CO2 that's being emitted through fossil fuels is coming from uh, uh, a product that uh, is created as a result of gas and oil. And so why, what do we have to do uh, in this community to be able to have the community that uh, Council, our Mayor talked about, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the folk from the inner cities of Australia who who have this uh, uh, fixation on uh, coal as being the big bad ogre on its own. What do we have to do to get the community of the cities to be able to see it for what it really is? Who wants to take that one? You have to deliver a low emissions product. I mean, the reality is when you burn natural gas, it's only about a third of the carbon dioxide emissions compared to when you burn, burn coal and you don't have the particulates and other things. If this project, the HESC project, is done with the fantastic gasification um, system that was described to us and carbon net quality uh, CCS, then that project is tackling the one and only thing that counts, which is atmospheric emissions of carbon dioxide. And that's what I would be promoting again and again and again. And it doesn't help 
frankly, when proponents of coal come up with fancy names that are frankly wrong, like high efficiency, low emissions. It's not true. And people see through that. So stick with the facts and do a good job. Well, I guess my point, though, is what, 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 why are we not um, um, getting oil and gas to take its share of the load in terms of the CO2 that's being emitted in the atmosphere? You're well placed to do I this can, one. I can have a stab at that. I, I don't think that your assumption is correct. Um, the oil and gas industry is under similar pressures with regard to emissions of CO2. Um, and, and that's happening around the country. Uh, I think it's quite well established now, given the size of the developments, that in actual fact, the, um, you know, some of the LNG projects are responsible for large sources of rising uh, amounts of uh, Australia's CO2 emissions. And all of those projects are therefore looking at ways in which they can uh, undertake a suite of options to reduce their um, emissions. So I don't think that's true. I think it's the, the, the reality is that this is something which is, um, uh, it's, a, it's an issue being confronted around the world. It's being confronted really across all of the traditional sources of fuels. But I think that the, the test really should be, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make sure that we have abundant and affordable and reliable energy, and at the same time we reduce emissions. And it really should be the test of how we can reduce emissions most effectively and most economically. And that's a proposition which is going to affect all fossil fuel sources. And um, I think also the other thing that we need, need to take account of is the performance of fossil fuels has been down through the ages very strong. So the issue to be resolved there is not one of whether they're going to be a continuing part in the um, energy cycle, it's more whether we can reduce the emissions which come from them. And that's, that's the challenge, and that's what this debate is all about. How do we best do that? And one of the ways in which we can do it in the case of coal and coal gasification, and indeed for some applications for oil and gas through steam methane reforming, and is to convert it into hydrogen. And the final point I think I'll come back to is a point that Alan made very well, I think, earlier today, which is the whole prospect of energy diversity of supply. And having hydrogen is one of the sources of diversity of supply. <coughs> okay. I'm going to call uh, stumps at this point, and I'd like you to thank the panel for their contribution. <laughs> <laughs>